the autonomic nervous system. There are four parts that we will go through. The first part is just a general overview and understanding the basic structure, which is known as the two-step pathway. The nervous system begins and ends with the central nervous system, which consists of the brain and spinal cord. Nerves or neurons coming off the brain and spinal cord traveling out to the body are part of the peripheral nervous system. The peripheral nerves not only send signals out to our body, but also relay sensory information back to the brain. There are two main categories of the peripheral nervous system. The somatic nervous system targets the skeletal muscles of our body, exerting voluntary control over movement. The autonomic nervous system is entirely involuntary, controlling our organs and tissues, such as the intestines, heart, and sweat glands. This involuntary control of our body is driven by parasympathetic nerves, which influence our body the vast majority of the time, allowing us to digest food and controlling other bodily functions. The sympathetic nerves only elicit influence on our body during strenuous exertion like exercise or stressful situations such as when we are worried or frightened. We will be covering these two portions of the autonomic nervous system now. The nerve roots and pathways for the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous systems are different from each other. Although both systems innervate most of the same tissues, thus most of our tissues and organs are dual innervated, meaning they contain receptors for both the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous systems and can respond to either. For example, the heart responds to the parasympathetic nervous system by slowing the heart rate down during times of relaxation, while the sympathetic nervous system activation will drastically increase heart rate. So the parasympathetic nervous system utilizes only specific cranial nerves, as listed before, and sacral nerves. It will target our tissues and it has a two-step pathway, which we'll discuss shortly. A hallmark for the parasympathetic system is that the first of the two neurons going to the heart, or in this case shown in the bladder, is a very long first neuron. And then the second neuron is a very short one that's actually within the tissue surrounding that organ. The sympathetic nervous system is known as thoracolumbar in that it only utilizes some thoracic and lumbar nerves. These spinal nerves from these regions go out and connect to a pair of chain ganglia. We only see one from this view, but there is actually a chain ganglia, these series of black dots interconnected on either side of the spinal cord. It is through these chain ganglia that will then direct the impulse throughout the entire body. In contrast to the parasympathetic, the sympathetic nervous system has a very short first neuron. So from the spinal cord to the chain ganglion is neuron number one. And then it has a much longer path as the second neuron goes to the organ to be innervated. So dual innervation means an organ that's innervated by both the parasympathetic and sympathetic, even if they get there by different routes. Also, we will discuss the neurotransmitters in another section, but just so that you know ahead of time, the parasympathetic releases acetylcholine. That is the signal. When an organ gets acetylcholine, it will then respond in a parasympathetic manner. The sympathetic nervous system will ultimately release norepinephrine. When an organ or tissue gets norepinephrine, it will respond in a manner that's consistent with flight or fight. For instance, a heart will increase the heart rate in ex when it gets exposed to norepinephrine from the sympathetic nervous system, or it will slow down when it gets exposed to acetylcholine from the parasympathetic. So the peripheral nervous system's two subgroups, the voluntary and involuntary, have different ways they innervate their target or organs. 
The somatic nervous system uses one neuron from the spinal cord that goes to a skeletal muscle. The autonomic nervous system uses the two-step pathway. We can see those here. So the somatic on the left is just for reference. It goes from the spinal cord. The star with line represents an, a motor neuron with an axon originating from the spinal cord all the way to the muscle to release acetylcholine indicated in green. On the right is our autonomic two-step pathway. We can see that the yellow, could, the first neuron in yellow can either be long or short. The second neuron in gray can also be long or short. And in the end, it will release either the green acetylcholine or red norepinephrine. So these represent our parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system's two-step pathway in contrast to what we see in the somatic pathway on the left. Note that the somatic only goes to skeletal muscles. It's one long neuron that releases its neurotransmitter acetylcholine indicated by the green triangles. Initially, the autonomic nervous system also releases acetylcholine, but that's to a ganglia to stimulate the next neuron that will go to the organ or tissue. The autonomic nervous system elicits either a parasympathetic or sympathetic response to the organ or tissue by sending either acetylcholine or norepinephrine from that second neuron. As mentioned before, for the heart, when it receives acetylcholine from this parasympathetic cranial nerve number 10, vagus nerve, the heart rate will slow down. Conversely, when the heart is exposed to norepinephrine from the sympathetic thoracic nerve or epinephrine through the blood, the heart rate will increase. The two-step pathway is a series of two neurons to get to an organ or tissue for the autonomic nervous system. The first neuron that comes off the central nervous system is the preganglionic neuron. That neuron coming off the central nervous system will always release acetylcholine. This is true even for the somatic nervous system that also uses one neuron, which is releases acetylcholine to a skeletal muscle. For the autonomic nervous system, shown here, the second neuron that will ultimately go to the organ or tissue being activated will release acetylcholine if it's from a parasympathetic neuron, cranial or sacral, or it will release norepinephrine if it's coming from a sympathetic neuron coming from the thoracic or lumbar nerves. Neurotransmitters elicit their effects through the receptor it binds to on the surface of the target cell. Acetylcholine binds to cholinergic receptors. There are two kinds of cholinergic receptors, a nicotinic receptor and a muscarinic receptor. The autonomic nervous system uses both of these, while the somatic, going to the muscles, uses only nicotinic at the neuromuscular junctions. Adrenergic receptors bind to norepinephrine or epinephrine. The adrenergic receptors have two groups. One group is alpha and the other group is beta. Both cholinergic and adrenergic have many subgroups of each of these receptor types, which are most often named with a subscript like alpha-1, alpha-2, or beta-1, beta-2, or nicotinic-1, or muscarinic-2, etc. Understanding the receptor and specific tissues that contain specific receptors is very important for understanding how a tissue works, as well as understanding the effects of pharmaceutical interventions have on those tissues. Many medications and drugs have the effects on specific receptors by either activating or blocking them. Here we see the peripheral nervous system pathways for the somatic and autonomic portions that include the neurotransmitters and their specific receptors. For voluntary skeletal muscles of the somatic nervous system, acetylcholine will bind to a nicotinic receptor that is on the surface of the muscle to stimulate the muscle to contract. For the two-step pathway of the autonomic nervous system, we can see that the pre ganglionic neuron coming off the brain stem or spinal cord releases acetylcholine in green triangles onto a nicotinic receptor. This is the same whether it's parasympathetic or sympathetic. It will always, that first yellow neuron will always release acetylcholine and it will always bind to a nicotinic.
the nicotinic receptors are located in the cell body and dendrites of the postganglionic neuron. It's at, in the sympathetic nervous system. It is these nicotinic receptors that are in the chain ganglia. When the postganglionic neurons, nicotinic receptor at those dendrites, is stimulated by acetylcholine, the postganglionic neuron will send an action potential down to reach its axon terminal that will be at the target tissue. For the parasympathetic neurons, the postganglionic neuron will release acetylcholine again. The acetylcholine will bind to a muscarinic receptor that is on the surface of the organ or tissue being targeted, such as the eye, intestines, sweat glands, or heart. For the sympathetic nervous system, the postganglionic neuron sends an action potential down the gray neuron to reach the axon terminal. This time, norepinephrine in red will be released onto either an alpha or beta receptor, depends on in the body where this is happening. If the alpha or beta receptor is stimulated, then the organ or tissue will respond in the manner of the sympathetic nervous system. For example, norepinephrine binding to an alpha or beta receptor on the heart will make it beat faster and contract more forcefully. On the eye, it will dilate to allow more light in so we can see danger better. In the intestines, it'll actually slow down digestion because we want blood flow to go to the muscles so that you can run away from danger more easily. This is a brief description of the opposing effects of the sympathetic and parasympathetic systems. The sum of the effects of the sympathetic nervous system is to increase alertness, deliver more oxygen to the tissues, decrease digestion, and waste removal to prepare the body to respond to some physical or emotional threat. Perception of threat and danger vary widely from individuals. So what one person is frightened of that would cause their sympathetic nervous system to respond may not be what causes another person's sympathetic response. The parasympathetic nervous system is what the predominant driver of our normal maintenance is in our everyday lives. The sympathetic activity only arises when a stressful event is encountered, which under normal circumstances is then resolved within minutes to hours. Many pathological conditions that are due to, quote, stress are often due to a chronic state of activity of the sympathetic nervous system where there is no resolution to a stressful situation. Let's go into some of the specific details of the sympathetic nervous system. These are a list of a number of the effects of the sympathetic nervous system. Recall they are thoracolumbar, so they utilize all the thoracic nerves, all 12, as well as two additional, the first two lumbar nerves. The sympathetic nervous system utilizes the two-step pathway. We have our thoracolumbar nerves coming off the spinal cord to a chain ganglia. The preganglionic neuron coming off from the spinal cord to the chain ganglia is relatively short. It will release acetylcholine. That acetylcholine will then bind to a nicotinic receptor, activating that second neuron, and then ultimately releasing norepinephrine to an alpha or beta receptor at the organ or tissue itself. The chain ganglia is known as a paravertebral in that there are two, one on either side, although that you only see one in this image. There is an additional cluster known as prevertebral or collateral ganglia that's farther out. These are specific to the abdominal pelvic region. This, we can see the paravertebral chain ganglia in blue on either side of the spinal cord. And then in green, we can see the prevertebral or collateral ganglia as it directs the impulses throughout the abdominal pelvic region, such as the stomach, abdominal blood vessels, liver, pancreas, adrenal gland, intestines, kidney, bladder, and gonads. The pathways through the sympathetic ganglia can be numerous. It can go out from the spinal cord to the chain ganglia and then out to various regions of the body that go beyond the chain ganglia. Remember, these come off just of the thoracic lumbar, but they have an outreach all the way up to the eye or all the way down to the bladder. 
releasing norepinephrine at those regions. Or it can come out the chain ganglia and then move straight through to the other side, again, releasing norepinephrine. Or it can go out the chain ganglia to the collateral ganglia and then distribute to various regions within the abdominal pelvic cavity, releasing norepinephrine there. Or it can go straight through the chain ganglia and collateral ganglia, so this is just the pregangliac neuron, to the adrenal gland. This is a unique scenario because you have one direct connection from the spinal cord to the adrenal gland. And then what happens is the adrenal gland is a gland in that it will release a hormone. The hormones are epinephrine and norepinephrine, and it's through the blood that the hormone from the adrenal gland will then send epinephrine and norepinephrine to these areas of the body. This is important for sustained response. So instead of nerve impulses going to your heart to keep your heart elevated because you're running away from something frightful, by having it released via the adrenal gland into the blood allows for that high level of activity from the heart and the shutdown of activity to the guts during times of stress allows that to be sustained over a longer period of time. The pathways to, through, and out the chain ganglia and collateral ganglia can be a little complicated. So the diagram on the right shows the spinal cord segments, the chain ganglia on either side, and one of the collateral ganglia from the abdominal cavity. We have the lateral gray horns of the spinal cord where we have the cell bodies for the autonomic motor control. The impulse will leave there, go out into the chain ganglia, it sort of loops around, and in this case, it's gonna go up the chain. For instance, it could be going up to the eye or some other region beyond that level. And then connect to the second neuron of the two-step pathway going out to the tissue. It can also leave the lateral gray horn and synapse right at the level of the chain ganglia and then go out at that same level right there. Or it could go out and go straight to a collateral ganglia in the abdominal cavity and then, which can be met by many different levels from the spinal cord, and at that collateral ganglia, it can then be distributed well beyond through the abdominal cavity from there. The pathway to the adrenal glands is that it never stops except for the adrenal gland. So it's one direct route from the spinal cord. It does go through both the chain ganglia and the collateral ganglia to the adrenal gland. It is then the adrenal gland that will release it into the blood to be distributed throughout the entire body. The parasympathetic nervous system, these are the effects associated with that system. This is the system that we primarily exist in, and it utilizes only four specific cranial nerves, as well as some sacral nerves. The parasympathetic ner nervous system uses cranial and sacral nerves. Although they originate far away from the organs, virtually all of the neurons to the thoracic and abdominal cavities actually just come from cranial nerve number 10. So we have the preganglionic neuron, that's going to release acetylcholine onto a tiny ganglia that will be at the level of the tissues. It binds to a nicotinic receptor and activates a second very short tiny neuron that will then release acetylcholine onto that organ or tissue, which will be received by a muscarinic receptor by the organ or tissue. The parasympathetic nervous system again is known as cranial sacral Cranial nerves number three, oculomotor, because it controls our pupil dilation or constriction. So if we're going to be in our mellow state, which is parasympathetic, we actually have our pupils constricted slightly. The facial, it stimulates our salivary glands associated with eating and digestion. Goes to number nine, the glossopharyngeal for swallowing and taste. And 75% of the parasympathetic nervous system actually just goes through the vagus nerve, 
The sacral nerves are in charge of more defecation, urination, as well as sexual arousal. Note that the sympathetic nervous system is what's associated with an achievement of orgasm, but arousal is achieved via the parasympathetic. We can see the distribution patterns in this image here. So in summary, we have the sympathetic nervous system, which is our flight or fight, and our parasympathetic nervous system, which can be referred to as feed and breathe. So in summary, the sympathetic is flight or fight. We have thoracolumbar nerves and that it only comes off the spinal cord from T1 through L2. It goes to chain ganglia. If it's in the abdominal cavity, it will then go through a second set of ganglia known as the collateral ganglia and then disperse throughout the abdominal cavity. We can see that paravertebral chain ganglia here as well as the collateral ganglia. And then there's the adrenal gland, that, which has a direct connection off of the spinal cord because the second step is really just released into the blood. The parasympathetic nervous system is feed and breed. We utilize these four cranial nerves. The majority is the vagus nerve, as well as S2, 3, and 4 of the sacral nerves. The ganglia are not noticeable anatomically. They are just found within the tissues with a very short postganglionic neuron. Referred pain is much different and has a very different body map than the body maps we have for sensory sensations of our body, like on the surface of our skin. Referred pain comes from our autonomic organs, which are not as clearly mapped out in our brain. So pain areas, say from the arm, it's quite common to know that radiating from the left arm would be associated with a heart attack. That's because your brain doesn't really have a place that it can identify heart versus lower lung or abdomen or large intestine. So the brain really relies on the dermatomes that we see on the left as a body map of pain that's associated near that region. So we have often odd placements of referred pain for our autonomic organs. Autonomic reflexes are an involuntary response that occur to a stimulus. So you can test your autonomic reflexes by a bright light in the eye that's going to change the iris of the muscle, changing your pupil size. It normally will reduce it because it wants to block the light coming in. If you don't have a response there, you know that there's a problem with the autonomic component. The barrel reflex right at the below our jaw senses pressure and it can change our heart rate, whether it raises it or lowers it, depends on the pressure that's coming into the brain. Waste elimination. If what's in your bladder or your rectum is full, there's a distension of the tissues there. That's the reflex elimination to just let it out. Now through potty training, we have some voluntary muscles that can override that temporarily, but the involuntary component is as soon as you get distension, your body wants to let that out. And digestive reflexes would include smelling yummy food, might get your salivary glands stimulating as well as gastric secretions occurring. So now we'll go on to identifying the pharmacology components, most of which we've discussed. So you're aware that the neurocholinergic and adrenergic are the two groups of neurotransmitters. Acetylcholine is in the cholinergic family and it binds to muscarinic or nicotinic receptors. The adrenergic family responds to norepinephrine and epinephrine and the receptors in that family are alpha or beta. Cholinergic receptors, they bind to acetylcholine and we can see in the skeletal muscle that respond, that is a cholinergic receptor, which happens to be a nicotinic, which is the same as the first neuron of the parasympathetic nervous system. The parasympathetic just has the second neuron, which will then stimulate a muscarinic at the level of the tissue. So nicotinic, there are agents that can be given to patients to block these. So anesthesia or muscle relaxants would block nicotinic receptors to reduce your awareness or in the case of muscle relaxants, reduce the effectiveness of muscle activation. 
Additional cholinergic agents might affect muscarinic receptors. Muscarinic receptors are going to be very specific for the actual autonomic organ or tissue itself. An agonist means something that's going to enhance it is going to increase the activity of that, of that parasympathetic effect. An antagonist is actually going to block the parasympathetic activity. For instance, somebody with irritable bowel syndrome or an overactive bladder will be given medication that is a blocker of these muscarinic receptors because the parasympathetic's job is to go ahead and pee or go ahead and move food along. Well, if it's overactive, then maybe we need to slow that down. So that would be a time that an antagonist would be given for a muscarinic receptor. Adrenergic receptors, they respond to norepinephrine and epinephrine, which is also known as noradrenaline and adrenaline. So we have the subgroups alpha, and they have further subgroups one, two, and so on. And so they can be compartmentalized. For instance, alpha one is more arteries in the heart, where beta one is contraction in the musculature of the heart. So adrenergic agents might be something like nebevilol or prazosin are going to be blockers in so that they will help lower blood pressure. You might do an alpha-1 agonist that's going to enhance the sympathetic nervous system that you might give to somebody if they're in shock. Conversely, if you give a beta-2 agonist like albuterol, that's going to open the airways in a treatment for asthma. So here's a summary slide showing you all of the neurotransmitters, acetylcholine and norepinephrine, as well as all of the receptors and their general placements along the pathway of the somatic, parasympathetic, and sympathetic nervous systems.